Americans and their contributions they've given in the struggle and in the party. Um, and I've met Francis a few times in Cleveland and also at the party conferences here. Um, so I, I think it's fitting that we recognize those contributions of this dear comrade and hopefully today we welcome into her revolutionary political life a new person. Um, you never really, you never know, you know, kids grow up and they have their own ideas about things. Um, but hopefully, I would say if we do our job, but you can do your job right and they do their own things, but hopefully she will become a new part of the new generation of revolutionaries. You know, in my short time in the party, and I had two political lives. The first was as a black nationalist when I was 15, and the second one began after 9-11 um, in response to racist, anti-Muslim, and anti-Arab remarks. But I, my short time in a party, I've been, you know, I think perhaps when I came in, and people get frustrated in the political movement. You get frustrated with other people in the political movement, you get frustrated with other comrades, <laughs> you get frustrated with the struggle, you get burned out sometimes, or sometimes people retreat and they become, they go backwards politically, unfortunately. Um, but, it, but sometimes people are expecting things to develop quickly and they don't, and they get, they're frustrated and they leave. And I have learned to look at things that even if we were to have a revolution tomorrow, you know, the, the real work is just beginning at that point. So it's a very long struggle. And, you know, I hope, and I'm relatively, you know, I'm 37, but youngish. I hope, you know, years from now, I can look around and see other revolutionaries looking back at me. I hope to continue my revolutionary life, you know, when I turn 60, 70, if I live that long. Because I think, when, when I look at comrades, I, I see a deep understanding, you know, that things don't happen overnight. And they may not happen in our particular lifetime, but we have faith in the necessity of overturning this brutal system, and that it can only be one class to do so. Um, you know, if you have not read the article uh, that I wrote for the paper, or you've never heard the name Clarence Moses L, and you most likely have not if you have not read the article, but he's one of many people who were railroaded into this system. There's 2.3 million people we have the highest rates of incarceration in the world and the highest number of prisoners. 2.3 million people in prison alone, another 5 million or more in jails on parole or probation. This country represents 5% of the world's population, more than 25% of its prisoners. Just think about that for a second. The most free society on the planet Earth, we are told, has the highest incarceration rates on the planet Earth yet has only 5% of the world's population. I was reading, you know, actually, before I came here, I was talking to Clarence Moses L's niece. And he's originally from the Baltimore area. He's from Maryland. And she said, you know, I haven't seen my uncle since I was five years old. She's 32. And she said, you know, I'm glad that you all are doing this because my grandmother, his mother, was the only she was organizing the family and trying to advocate on his behalf, but she died in November. And Clarence couldn't go to her funeral, just like he couldn't go to the funeral of four of his siblings who passed away while he's been incarcerated. And she said, what can I do? You know, my family now, they've seen the petition, they've seen this renewed energy, so what can we do to help? We want to know what we can do to help. And she began telling me about some conversations she had with another uncle. You know, I, I have, I've been thinking about the idea of being, of being locked away for so long and how it might seem like a half-life. You know that time when you wake up in the morning and you can't move, your eyes are open and you see everything around you and you can't move and, you, and everything is sort of happening but you feel like, you feel sort of helpless. 
and I, I sometimes, you know, I get paranoid. I think if somebody were to attack me at this moment, there's nothing I could do about it. You know, everything is going on around you, but you can't do anything about it. I imagine that in some way it feels that way, being locked in the dungeon. Life goes on, and you live sort of a half-life, locked in the dungeon somewhere. You can't reach out and touch people that you love, and if they pass away, you can't see them or bury them. In this particular case of Clarence, you know, I think we live, number one, in a very, a, a, something happens in an advanced imperialist nation with culture and how it seems to go backwards. The more technologically, the more advanced capitalism becomes, the more socially people go backwards in relation to one another and they become alienated from one another, even their own family members at a certain point. And so if you look at you know, they, the way they justify the system is saying, oh, well, a person must pay for the crimes they commit. And, you know, it's antisocial behavior, but it's an antisocial system. Look at what happened in West Virginia. 300,000 people, and we're told, we were told a few days afterwards, the water is fine. Yet if you see the pictures of the water and people pour it, it still looks like sludge. It's very murky, and they're told it's fine. You can drink it. But we lock people away. And the people who own that business, they're free to go about and continue to pollute and use hydraulic fracturing. You know, in Colorado, a few months ago, there was floods. They call them the thousand-year floods. And what happened is these chemicals seeped out and contaminated all the places that had been flooded. But the people who were responsible for pumping those chemicals in the ground and poisoning well water Nothing happens, and poisoning the ground, nothing happens to them. Those who bomb countries and kill and maim, nothing happens to them. Yet we have a brother, and I'm gonna get to his case, who's been locked away for 27 years. But why has he been locked away? The simple answer is, for nothing at all. In 1987, in Denver, and if you've ever been to Denver, I assume most of you have not been to Denver. I lived there for 10 years. I began my second life as an organizer in Denver. I was living in Denver when I helped organize people to go to Cuba and I met Teresa and Leilani, which is you know, the reason why I wound up joining the party. And I began organizing there, primarily against uh, state repression. But in Denver in 1987, a young woman was brutally assaulted and she lost vision in one of her eyes due to the assault. And when the police first arrived, the, the first names that she said were most likely responsible were Elsie Earl, who's Elsie's brother, and Darnell. And this was the story until a day and a half later she had a, a dream and said that it was Clarence Moses L. What led to that happening, you know, it's hard to say. All I do is know somebody was brut brutally assaulted. Um, and the person who was responsible for it actually continued to roll in the streets. But the, the trial, the, the people who originally were identified were never called to question, never investigated, and it was simply Clarence Moses L, who maintained his innocence, who was put on trial by the state, um, by the district attorney's office in Denver. There was no evidence to tie him to any crime, that he committed a crime. And he was offered a plea then, and he was offered a plea later, and he refused to take it because he was innocent. DNA evidence was fairly new at that point. And I think, you know, Julie can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of defense attorneys did not want to actually use DNA evidence because it was so very new. Apart, something was tested, I think it was blood or semen, and it actually did not match Clarence Moses L. It matched the person who, one of the people who, had, who was identified, who was now in prison for rape of a mother and her nine-year-old daughter. So he was convicted, and he was put in prison, and he had asked all along that the evidence, the DNA evidence, be tested and it was never tested, and he finally won a court order um, to have it tested. The way he was able to do that is the O.J. Simpson trial had, you know, all that 
that whole business had jumped up interest in DNA evidence because that's what you heard about, DNA evidence, DNA evidence. And so he contacted Barry Sheck of the Innocence Project and he was told that you would need to come up with a thousand dollars. And you know who raised that thousand, who helped him get the thousand dollars? It was fellow prisoners. Because they had heard his story over and over and over and over, so they helped contribute so he can get that thousand dollars and he won a court order. He won a court order to have it tested. And it sat in a box that was labeled, do not destroy. And four weeks later, it was destroyed. And it was never tested. And he said, you know, in one of his interviews, he said it was, I was destroyed. And I was, because what am I to do when there's nothing to show that I'm not guilty, that I committed no crime? But he continued to fight. And he continued to struggle and tell his story over and over and over. And he began to get more, there was a, a story that was done on cases like this. Um, Tim Masters was another case in, in Colorado and a few other cases. And some of them, if you just look at, there was one of developmentally disabled black man who the police had written a statement, who couldn't write, couldn't read, yet he could somehow write this eloquent statement and they presented this as evidence. He was coerced into making this confession and they said that he wrote it down. Um, and had been in prison for over 20 years. But he continued to, and there was this story done and they did a video interview of Clarence. And it began, and this was in two, 2006, 2007, somewhere about. And the Denver Post and began to take notice and a, a reporter, a journalist, began writing about this case and was able to contact Kim Gordon, who just passed away last year, who was a, who was a former defense attorney who became um, a uh, state senator in Colorado, was, you know, liberal. And it began to it put forward a bill to the Colorado legislature um, that would help get clearance free and that would sort of go around the Supreme Court precedent which states that the destruction of DNA evidence in and of itself does not constitute bad faith, which is almost impossible to actually prove on the part of the defense. And so this bill was to give him a second shot at life because the evidence was destroyed and he had no chance to defend himself. Um, but it was, again, shot down by the legislature based off of the uh, testimony of Mitch Morrissey, who is now the current DA uh, in uh, the city and county of Denver. So again, he was left to wonder what would become of him. A few, uh, our comrade, Mark Burton, who has won the Gideon Award in Colorado for defending Sharif Aleem, if comrades remember that struggle, of a person who was attacked by police and was charged with third degree aggravated assault, was facing 16 years inside of prison. Successfully defended, you know, Mark Burns successfully defended Sharif Aleem and won an award for that. And as a people's attorney, today he was telling me, you know, I gotta, I gotta slow down, but what can I do? People walk in my door and they have nothing and they're desperate. And I can't just say no. And he said, I'm getting older and I gotta slow down, but I, I don't think I can. And he took this case and he contacted me and said, you know, um, this man has gotta be free. It ha you know, he has to be free. And so that's when I began to be a part of the case and the party began you know, writing about it and organizing and developing a petition. Well, the person, Elsie Jackson, who was actually, I think, tried in 2005 or 2007 for the 1992 uh, rape of the mother and daughter, wrote a letter to Clarence Moses L. And he apologized in the letter. And he, he said, let's begin by bringing something that was in the dark into the light. And he said, send me your lawyer so they can interview me so I can confess. And he told a story of what happened, but also it's the story of what led, to, it's the story of the brutal assault of the woman. 
I won't go into his whole story, you know, but he is basically, he is saying, I'm responsible for what happened to her. And Mitch Morrissey still refuses to reopen the case and set Clarence Moses L. free. His response is he's had his day in court. Regardless of the lack of evidence and regardless of the evidence that proves him to have been innocent all along. And so that's where we come in. We have worked for years tirelessly. You know, I think if for, for people who've never been around, and maybe this is your first meeting, your second, your third meeting, just pick anyone out of this room and ask them the activities they've been involved with in the party and organizing in the mass movement. And you will find a wealth of information, unbelievable stories of courage and revolutionary optimism that exists in this room today. And it's not like people are going to volunteer it to you. It's not like they're going to wear a shirt that says, I've been there and I got the t-shirt to show for it. You won't know it because they're not that kind of people. And so throughout the life of the party, whether it was Rob Williams and May Mallory defending them, whether it was fighting against the death penalty that would have put Mamiya in prison, and if you talk to Pam Africa today, I mean, put him to death, I'm sorry, Pam Africa today, she will tell you it was the IAC that stepped forward and kept them from killing Mamiya. The two times that the death row was signed in 95 and 1999. It was the mass movement, but the organizers, the people who, who made it their life to make sure that the state did not kill our brother, a lot of them are in this room today and it was spread around the country. So whenever we find a case like this, doesn't matter what's on our plate, we get in on the ground and do what we can to make sure that justice is done. Because it's part of our revolutionary understanding. Some, one battle itself is not just isolated. It's part of the struggle against the state and against capitalism. And this struggle to free Clarence Moses L. is part of a general struggle against racism and white supremacy and state repression of people of color in this country. So I will get to some of the, what we're doing with the campaign. We floated a petition, and Nine News, which is the NBC affiliate in Denver, Colorado, wrote a news story about the petition, saying that two days after MLK Day, they had received thousands of news tips. Their inbox had been flooded with news tips regarding this case, and they printed the actual petition on their website. So that means that if Nine News received all those news tips, and I don't know how, how the, you know, what that translates into as far as the actual petitions are signed, then the district attorney has received the same amount. The attorney general, the mayor, the entire Colorado legislature, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the city council, all have received these petitions demanding that Clarence Moses L be free and laying out the reasons why he should be freed. And this is just the beginning of the campaign. Already news, there's been um, uh, radio interviews. I did an interview with Black Agenda Report earlier today. There's radio interviews in Denver. There's other people who want to pick up and do radio shows on a particular case. There's a call-in campaign that begins next week, as well as beginning the actual protest part of it. And the Aurelia campus, which houses three univers well, two universities, one university, one college, and one community college. We've already had three invites to speak to classes. One of them is an American political system class of over 100 students. I think that this is just, this seems you know, fairly big, considering the fact that just a few months ago, you would have been hard pressed to actually find anything talking about this particular case. In talking to his niece, and I won't mention her name because she did not give me permission to do so, she believes that this renewed en energy is going to lead to him being free. And I believe it as well. We don't know exactly what the court is going to decide. They have 63 days to respond, and I think they will respond by next week because the deadline is coming up. And 
and I think it's going to be positive, the response, so the new evidence could be presented. But regardless, this is the atmosphere where Marissa Alexander has been set free because of a mass campaign. Right. It's the atmosphere that got Mamiya off of death row and that will eventually get him out of prison. The atmosphere that got our brother Herman Wallace out of prison to die, but they would have left him in a cage to die, no doubt, no doubt about it, they would have left him there to die. And it's the atmosphere that got our sister Lynn Stewart free and brought her home to New York City. And I believe that people who've been paying attention and supporting these campaigns are gonna take up this one as well. And hopefully, a few weeks from now, maybe a month from now, maybe a couple of months from now, Clarence Moses L's family will welcome him home. So thank you, comrades, for signing the petition and participating. Free Clarence Moses L, all power to the people.